we used to be Team Mahavatan, and the robot is Buddy from Team Mahavatan, but uh, Jim Crittenden, who was the lead in the past for the Team Mahavatans that have done three of the DARPA challenges, decided that he didn't want to lead this particular one, so uh, I became the leader, and we changed the name to Grit Robotics at his kind of request. Carl Castleton, Dr. Castleton, a computer science professor at the local university. They had actually worked at a DARPA competition before. They had made a, a self-driving car for the 2007 Grand Challenge. They, had, they converted a, I think it was a Cherokee or something like that. And they successfully competed in the challenge and they got pretty far in it. They're interested in you know, continuing to compete with the DARPA challenges because they've, they've had so much success with it. And I was just uh, working with Carl. I used to work at a place called the Math and Science Center. And uh, he came and helped me teach a bunch of middle schoolers how to build robots. And I'm the person who really started out this, well, even last year, I was the person who said, I think we should just build a chassis ourselves. We, we actually applied for resources from DARPA and got told no, because uh, they didn't think you know, we, we had enough skills to do that. So then we uh, set about building our own bootstrap chassis and then we actually showed it to DARPA, and DARPA invited us to the actual challenges, or the trials, uh, uh, the trials this last December, December 2013. So we've been in the DARPA robotics challenges before for the urban challenge and the desert challenge, so those are autonomous car contests. We did very well, um, and, uh, and we were a homebrew team then as well, so there wasn't a big corporate sponsor or contract that covered our costs those times either. We made it into the challenge and competed in the semifinals without funding and yet out of the hundreds of people that applied we were one of the teams that made it just from small town Colorado and I think that really shows that we have the knowledge and the know-how to do it now we just need the money to buy the parts and the time. So the challenge is you know a disaster recovery robot right what, what it is is imagine something like Fukushima nuclear power plant has failed and uh, really we want to send some robots in rather than humans because that's really what happened in Fukushima is they actually sent in people. Um, so what you do is you'd send this robot in to then repair the facility and get it up and running again or at least get it stable to where it was habitable by people. And, and the reason why it has to be kind of human size and human form is because you don't want it to have to have a special conditions. You want it to just be able to walk on the catwalks, go up the ladders, open the doors that, that humans had to open to get to those facilities and remove some rubble and debris and stuff. So that's all what it needs to be able to do. So it's a lot of people in this competition are in it to win it. I mean, they they really have to because somebody somewhere on the long is along the line has invested millions of dollars into their project. We have a little bit different approach. I mean, this is all something none of us have ever done before, or if we have, it's a minimal amounts of robotics experience that we have under our belt. So all of us are really in it just to learn. We've created a quadruped robot mostly out of aluminum, 3D printed plastic pieces. We use a Fit PC, um, a LiDAR, a webcam, and uh, servo motors. So uh, we really plan to do this. We, I mean, we plan to field the robot and do our best to show what it can do, it's capable of. But really this joint that we're working on, and there's a lot of discussion, that's why we're measuring stuff today, is uh, really what we want to do is design a joint that is is affordable, that you can actually build a robot that is kind of this human-sized robot. So, you know, uh, say it comes in at $100, $150, you could actually buy 12 of those and make a quadruped robot that could actually carry 40 pounds of weight. Um, and, and that would only cost you $500, $600 to actually manufacture that robot. That's our goal, really. And, and no matter what we do, like whether we get invited to the, uh, the actual challenge um, or not, uh, our, our goal is to actually produce that joint so that people just like average Joes can actually um, build a robot like these robots that these multi-million, you know what I mean, or half million dollar robots that these other teams have. We're doing a lot of prototyping right now. We're buying uh, fairly expensive components that we're probably just going to break so we can figure out where their, their, their limits are in it. And if we, if we have a larger fund to draw from, then we can do a lot more experimenting. We can do a lot more prototyping. We can try out um, things that would normally be out of our, our price range because we're just trying to make the cheapest thing we possibly can, uh, trying to 3D print as much of it as possible because it's, I mean, plastic's pretty cheap. But if we, if we had more funds to draw from, then we can get into more complex manufacturing stuff. We can use CNC machines to, to etch out our, 
our hypocycloidal gears, so it'll be tremendously more strong. The current servos we're using just can't handle. They're not rugged enough to handle what we need. They don't have the power. Um, they burn out too easily. So once they design this new joint, it's going to be non-back drivable, so the robot will just be able to stand there. It'll be much more sturdy, much more strong. The big problem we had in December, a lot of the reasons we failed a lot at uh, a lot of the challenges was we're using these little motors called Dynamexels, and they're they're kind of a robotic industry standard for this type of application. There's actually other people there who are competing with Dynamexels, but we found out that they cannot nearly perform at the specs that they're plan that they uh, are reported to be able to. So we're going in. We're starting from a, a base level approach. We're taking just an existing motor and designing around that, and we're using a really cool gear reduction system called hypocycloidal gearbox. So actually, you know, what's funny is we would probably not spend more on parts. I think our robot that we had this last time, the Buddy chassis from Mojaveton, is more expensive than the robot we plan to build this time. And we haven't really changed it, so it doesn't seem na right to change its name since we haven't changed it. So uh, when we get done with it, I think this chassis will actually be... Uh, from it. Um, and we definitely learned a lot out of getting uh, a chance to be in the trials. So we got to see how our first, like our Rev Zero version of the robot worked in that context. And, um, and it gave us a lot of ideas about what to do now to make uh, just a more effective robot. And, may, and interestingly, a, a lower cost robot than what we even had first time through. So that's interesting for sure. And with this new design that we're having, uh, after we went to Florida in December, we competed. We learned a lot then, and we have a lot of really good designs, and I think some really innovative designs that we're going to implement into the new robot design. If we had everything we could possibly want for resources, the great goal would be to see a device that could conveniently be part of like fire stations and police departments um, as an assistant to send into dangerous situations and be able to assess things in a way that a wheeled robot does not work because wheeled robots don't navigate human environments very well. So you want a legged system that can go through and um, you know, step over the laundry basket or step around it, whereas wheeled robots just get in all kinds of trouble if you just sort of put them into some sort of scattered room. So there's a, there's a big advantage to uh, walking. I mean, that's why nature chose it, right, as a way to get around. So if you structure the world for the robots, then it makes sense to have wheels and things like that. But the, but the world we live in isn't like that. And that's fine. Um, it's just where we need to move to next. There was a number of times where we were asked like, to do a particular task, and we were risking a component that's about $500 a piece. And in fact, we went through. So the real thing is, is that we would not have to uh, have been as conservative. We would have been willing to spend the 100 bucks to do well at it, as opposed to spending $500 to do something. And that, that's really the motivation um, for saying, we're gonna build this joint and it's gonna be cheaper, is because we, we wanna be able to, if they will fail, but hopefully we'll design them so they're very solid and they won't fail, if they do fail, it's only $150 out of our pocket, not $500 out of our pocket. Because we're kind of like a team that's focused on learning, it's really become kind of like a center of learning for people. Uh, we like to take it and show it uh, to a bunch of uh, kids to get them interested in robotics. Uh, there's a local engineering firm that's actually pretty big, Capco. Uh, they, they do like $50 million a year. Uh, some of our designs are, get, are feeding into some of the biomedical devices that they're currently uh, developing. It's so it's, it's more of a learning platform than anything. One thing we're really trying to do is make robotics cheaper for everybody. If you're trying to get a prosthetic arm these days, like a really cool one that, you know, if, if, uh, if through military action, say someone loses an arm and they want a functional, like a moving prosthetic, we're really, it's really a cost of, of uh, on the order of a million dollars to build a prosthetic that works uh, these days. And you, can, you see this in the robot, so basically you can think of a robot as a giant prosthetic in some sense. And they're very expensive to get a human scale robot right now that can participate in, as an assistant for dangerous tasks, things like that. So one of the goals here in reducing the cost will change, change a $2 million platform into what we hope is a, on the order of a few thousand dollar platform. 
the gear systems and motor systems are just ridiculously out of anybody's budget if you don't have million dollar backings to it. So we really foresee the, the joints that we're developing right now. I mean, currently our cost is like $50 a joint for torques that are much higher than anything you could get for anywhere really 10 times the cost. So not only will it help other, to inspire other people to work on robotics, kids to work on robotics, so they grow up and they work on robotics. But I mean, we can also push out new developments, new innovative designs that allow people that are already into robotics to make their robots a lot cheaper.